powerful trends are shaping the market and the next wave of insurance. Open insurance and ecosystems, for instance, a new customer-driven basis of competition. Think of the workforce transformation, the promise of a human-centered, tech-enabled enterprise. And, of course, there's sustainability, an historical opportunity to lead, innovate and grow with a purpose. So, how should insurance leaders respond? According to EY and Esure Group, it's all about urgency, creative thinking and bold action. Welcome them on stage. Morning yeah, and welcome. Um, now, so I want to I want to make a statement first. Um, I think um, I think the, the insurance industry has sometimes a slightly unfair reputation about being um, you know, slow to respond to change, uh, lack of innovation. Uh, and you know, so as I, was, as I was kind of doing my research um, for this event, I decided to go back in time a little bit to say, OK, you know, what, uh, what's, the, what's the insurance industry innovated over the last, last few years, last few decades? Uh, and actually, I found some remarkably uh, uh, amazing examples, uh, actually, you know, going, back, going back a long time. So, for example, did you know you could buy an insurance that uh, you can insure against the risk of alien abduction? Uh, and uh, that 27,000 people have actually bought this policy. Um, but here's the best part. To actually make a claim, uh, you've got to be abducted by an alien, returned back to Earth, uh, and then make a claim. Um, but you know, that's a pretty cool um, uh, example of uh, innovation. You can even insure against the risk of falling coconuts. Um, apparently, it's a real thing. Um, so I asked one of my actuarial friends, I'm going on a holiday to a tropical place in the summer. Is this something I need to worry about? Um, and uh, he said, actually, I have a higher chance of stubbing my toe against my bed rather than a falling coconut. Um, how he calculated that, I, I don't know. But again, another example. Uh, but my um, absolute favorite is this. Uh, World Cup Disappointment Insurance. Um, so you can actually insure against the uh, trauma of a World Cup loss. And it's actually sold in England, which makes it kind of even more remarkable. So, so that, that, that's, that's just some lighthearted examples. Um, but you know, if, you, if you think about what we speak uh, at, at, uh, uh, on these conferences, you know, we talk a lot about innovation, technology, uh, trends, um, but I think I think we can all agree that the pace of change, the pace of adoption uh, has been relatively slow um, compared to, I think, what, what people expected. Um, uh, you, you have to think, why is that? Is there, is there some existing inertia about the industry? Uh, or, or is it just a natural cycle? Uh, or, or is it the case that sometimes People have good ideas, but you don't necessarily have the uh, have the, the the forces and the environment around it to actually um, actually make that option uh, go faster. Um, so, I mean, uh, time travel with me here. Uh, what do you think are the most groundbreaking innovations uh, over time? I mean, if you, if you're up for it, shout it out. Go back in history. Um, Think about. I'm, I'm not talking about kind of internet, and so 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 go back in time. Um, what comes to mind? Sliced bread. Sliced bread. Yes. Um, anything else? Electricity. Electricity. Yep. Go back a bit further. Fire. Uh, and in fact, so last time I did this, someone said marriage, which I thought was was quite interesting. Um, actually, the wheel. Uh, the wheel is genuinely one of the most groundbreaking innovations in our history. It changed everything. It, it, it connected people, it connected places, uh, economies were formed. Um, and now the, the wheel was uh, invented, I think, around 3500 BC. And you think, well, why did it take so long? Like any caveman, or anyone, frankly, you would think around objects roll. I mean, that's, that's, that's kind of not hard. So why did it take so long for the wheel to be invented? It turns out the wheel wasn't the hard part. 
it was the axle that took uh, the longest to figure out. That was the most complicated thing to figure out. Um, so the axle was really the kind of enabling force to realize the real potential of the wheel. And the reason I, reason I, I'm, I, I'm mentioning this is uh, what I want to spend the next kind of 15, 20 minutes um, with, um, with Roy is talking about you know, the four big mega trends uh, that I believe will have a structural and long-lasting impact uh, on insurance in the future. Uh, now, is it the case of we have the wheel but without the axle? I, I don't think so. I, I, I genuinely believe the wheel and the axle are, 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 are there in the, in the case of these uh, mega trends. Um, yeah, so to kind of spark the discussion, I'd like to invite Roy onto the stage, please. Morning, Good. everyone. Do you want to do a quick in, uh, introduction? Yeah, sure. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Roy Jabraj. I'm uh, Chief Strategy and Transformation Officer at Eshore Group. Uh, we're a sort of mid, middle, mid-tier uh, retail insurer in the UK market, probably in scale of about a billion dollars in revenue, written premium. Um, and uh, about three and a half years ago, we were pri private equity taken over um, and taken back into the private markets. And we're in the midst of a large-scale digital tech and business transformation agenda. Um, very, uh, very pleased to be here today. Um, previous to joining Eshore, I was at Accenture for about 23 years in their insurance and retail financial services sector, driving innovation and digital agenda for clients. Cool. Thanks, Roy. Um, and and we'll, get into, we'll, 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 we'll get into some of the experiences um, Roy and Eshore are going through as we, as we kind of discuss these trends. Um, so the first one I want to start off with is an obvious one. I mean, you know, we've been talking about it for 20 years now. So the whole digitalization, the digitization of, uh, of the market. Um, and it's only now post the pandemic we're seeing real acceleration of it. Uh, and, and Roy, I, I think this is where when I, when I kind of look at the industry uh, across your peer group, uh, I think you should have taken quite a bold approach to digital transformation. So yeah, I, I, I was, uh, why don't you kick us off by talking a little, a little bit in terms of what approach did you take and maybe even what other options you considered uh, and, and didn't go ahead with it? Yeah, I mean, I think um, it was very clear that um, it was uh, an organization uh, that's grown over 20 years, uh, but uh, it probably didn't keep up with the evolving tech environment around it. Um, it uh, grew very smart, but it grew very safe um, in terms of what it wanted to do. So I think the, you know, our, our shareholders saw a real opportunity where we can actually take a holistic um, tech-driven agenda, data-driven agenda. So we set out a, um, a very sort of core set of strategic objectives which is a digital first, data smart, scaled insure tech. So we want to be a tech company that happens to sell insurance. And that's our, that's our objective, our purpose. Um, that's been driven through the top of the organization all the way down uh, to the most junior staff in the, in the enterprise. And we set out um, an agenda where we wanted to build a greenfield front to back digital architecture uh, which is cloud first and um, focused on digital as its core and uh, data smart at its, at its core. And, and the intent there was we wanted a couple of outcomes. Number one, we want to shift from um, a, a sort of a 30% digital contact engagement uh, with our consumer base to about 80 to 90% uh, digital contact base and how we actually serve our customers. Uh, because we feel that our customers engage in the retail markets very, very similar. So w why, why are we any different? Um, but to do that, we wanted to build a greenfield architecture. So we started with no constraints from our legacy stack. We literally started new. Uh, we looked at lots of different tools and applications and um, softwares out in the market and we selected about 20 in terms of our end-to-end -end architecture build from front-facing, front office, all the way to integration uh, to our payment systems and our ledgers. And so we're going through a full greenfield build um, of that architecture. We've actually deployed the architecture um, early this year, uh, with about 80% of it built um, with a new proposition to the market, and we're starting to scale that proposition in the market right now. So 
we've been moving quite fast. Um, but that, that, that sort of building a green field, uh, we did that for two reasons. The first was we didn't want any constraints in terms of how we actually think about the customer journeys, how we want the customer to engage, what do the propositions look like. We didn't want any constraints in terms of the legacy environment over the last 20 years conflicting with what we want to do and where we want to get to in the end state. So that was one. The second, we genuinely felt that we could do it fast. And speed was of the essence. We didn't need to get the architecture 100% correct end to end. We needed to just get it good enough so we could deploy it and get customers using it and actually learn and actually get that insight very, very quickly so we can reapply and optimize it. So that's the approach that we took in terms of how we looked at our digitalization yeah. agenda. No, thanks, Roy. And you know, when, I, when I kind of reflect on it, the analogy I often use is, in a lot of organizations are trying to re-engineer legacy to, uh, and sometimes you have to do that. You, you have you have a lot of constraints. It's almost like you know you, you're you're not just building a speedboat. I mean, you're building a speedboat, but you're kind of sinking the mothership as well, which 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 I think is quite bold compared to uh, com compared to a lot of the organizations. Um, Kind of related question to that. I mean, you can't be a digital organization if you're not, uh, you know, customer centric. And again, I know it's a very catch-all broad, broad term. So, to, talk, talk to us about the practical, organizational, and, and changes that you've had to make to 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 kind of be customer centric. Yeah, I mean, I think I mean, I think um, it, it's fair to say, and, and hopefully, I'm not insulting anybody in the room, but um, historically, the sector has driven its propositions on a product basis, not a customer basis. Um, I think it's only recently that we're starting to see a shift in what we call real, real insights around how you actually cater to customers' needs and what does that look like. Um, and one of the things that we did is we, we actually did a full inventory um, of all the pain points that we've got with how we engage with customers, what the propositions look like, what the regulators want us to do versus how we've interpreted that. And how has that resulted in terms of how we actually service our customers? And in doing so, uh, we've, we've put that at the heart of um, fix insurance for good. And that is a real keen purpose that we've got in the enterprise. How do we start to fix these pain points properly and actually get better outcomes for the customer? We've also uh, reconfigured the enterprise in terms of how we actually think about um, servicing new propositions and actually driving engagement with our customers. So we've created a product driven customer first configuration of our op operating model. Um, so everybody's at the core in terms of ensuring that those pain points get fixed, not only in the front facing process that we've got with our customers, but every aspect of how we hand off uh, either to internal processes or teams or suppliers um, as we deal with claims. So we've really focused on a configuration of the business, the operating model, and the customer experience pain points to, to try to fix. Thanks, Roy. So a key message is, you know, no matter what your size and scale, actually kind of digital transformation, I know it's again a broad kind of catch-all term. How do, you, how do you kind of re-engineer the organization front to back, I think is going to be absolutely critical um, in terms of the future. So the next one, uh, actually there's a bit of an overlap to the previous presentation, which is good because it would have been weird if we, if we talked about completely different trends, uh, is around actually you know, uh, ecosystems and open insurance. Now, open finance, uh, open banking has been around a little bit longer um, and you know, it's frankly is one of the defining trends of the, uh, of, of the decade. Um, customers want more affordable, more transparent, more customized solutions. And for that, uh, you know, ecosystems and how you think about it is, is, is absolutely kind of critical. So again, coming back to you, Roy, so tell us about how are in, in the kind of the issues new digital co, how are you thinking about role of ecosystems and what are you doing? Well, I mean, I think it was, it, it was pretty critical in terms of how we actually designed the architecture that we built on the ground. Um, we went cloud first. We went with a microservices based architecture. We went with that intent because we know that the market's evolving. We know that there's new insured techs and new solutions that are going to come and evolve in the market. And we wanted the opportunity to plug and unplug uh, those solutions very, very easily and not actually create um, a legacy as soon as we implement the architecture. So that was one of the key principles that we adhered to. Um, and our intent is that um, whilst we're fixing our core and um, our strategic intent with our current channel strategy, we believe that the channel strategy will evolve over time. So things like embedded insurance, things like new partnerships, 
those are all on the horizon associated to what we want to do and how we want to diversify not only our channel strategy but also our growth and, um, aspirations in terms of what we want to do. So the services based architecture becomes quite critical. Number one for our ability to actually engage with partners in a much more seamless fashion in terms of what we're doing. And we're actually forcing lots of our suppliers in our claims network to essentially have a very API first services based engagement with us. How we transfer data, how we look at data, how we actually engage um, in that integration with them. And so um, they're upskilling their capabilities to make sure that we can get efficiency, we can get speed, we can implement very fast. So for me, um, the whole ecosystem play is a no brainer. Uh, you know, I think the market's going to evolve quite heavily. I think embedded insurance and what we call affinity 2.0 uh, will start to take effect very quickly. Um, I think there's a whole market that we're probably not engaging with uh, that we're currently exploring and I think loads of insurers are starting to explore in terms of what that looks like. And, and I think by the time we get our foundational architecture built, we'll have some good accelerators for us to go out to the market. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then the key, the key thing I, I think for, for any organizations is this is, this is much broader than a, a tech. You've, you've got to look at it from a, a business model perspective. I mean, you talked about, you talked about technology, you talked about uh, actually, you know, how do you think about from a distribution perspective? So you've got to, you've got to, you've got to take that business model lens. Um, you, can, you, can you touch on in terms of how this has influenced your thinking in terms of kind of data architecture as well? Because again, sure. you know, having, if, if you want to play in that open insurance ecosystem driven market, actually if you haven't got your data strategy and the data stack right, it's almost impossible. So maybe a little bit on that. Yeah, and look, uh, we, we don't have a silver bullet on this. Yeah. This <laughs> is hard work, right? Uh, I think every organization goes through a quite painful process in terms of how they think about their data architecture and how they create a much more flexible architecture in terms of what that looks like. Um, and, and we went through that pain over the last couple of years. We're starting to get some fruits uh, for the investments that we've started to lay down. So we, we've got, we've got, um, we use uh, accelerators out in the market that do most of the work and then we um, complement that with a bunch of open source uh, utilities um, for how we ingest data much, much quicker. Uh, so we've got loads of data that we want to ingest with partners, uh, with suppliers, um, and we think that data ingestion informs us in terms of how we actually are more constructive in terms of how we think about our propositions, but more personalized in terms of the customer experience that we have. Um, so we, we, built a, we built a data architecture. Uh, we're starting to see much more acceleration in terms of how we ingest. And actually we're thinking about how we publish different layers of that architecture for different consumers of the data. Uh, so we've got standard um, analytical capabilities across the enterprise. But we've also in the last 12 months actually built out a pretty strong data science capability with a lot of machine learning uh, frameworks starting to take effect and ML ops essentially starting to get operationalized. And we're starting to see some benefits of that. But it's been hard work. Um, it's been a lot of hard work. And we, and we still have a lot of hard yards to, to, uh, to deal with in terms of yeah. rich legacy data that we've got and how we actually get that into the new architecture. So I think it, it's one that continues to yeah. need to be invested in. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think, you know, from a digital perspective and ecosystem perspective, I think, you know, getting, getting, that, getting that right. And as you say, it's much more of an iterative process rather than, rather than a silver bullet. Um, uh, next one I want to talk is, is actually less kind of technology related, but, you know, the whole concept of uh, uh, workforce transformation that, that we are seeing play out. And again, you kind of, to, to use Roy's bullet, I, you know, I, 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 I don't think there is a silver bullet around here. You know, we are, we are operating in, we are trying to find different models in this whole hybrid working world. I mean, if I, if I go back a few years, the, the whole kind of thesis was around, you know, automation uh, taking jobs away uh, and, and actually that, that won't cause a massive kind of impact on insurance when skills are, skills are not coming as fast into the market. But in reality, I think what, what we are seeing is a much more subtle emerging of uh, technology um, technology and kind of human, uh, human skills so to, to, to be a much more kind of human driven tech enabled enterprise, a bit of a mouthful. Um, so Roy, let, let's, let's sort of t talk about, you know, how are you looking at this from a people perspective? You talked about technology, you talked about data, you talked about partnerships and ecosystems. Um, from a, you know, no doubt like a number of the organizations here, you're competing very hard in the talent market. So, um, so may, may, maybe let's start with that in terms of what, what sort of 
challenges you've, you're experiencing and how you're attracting talent? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think um, th this is very much a, a business transformation as it is a tech transformation that we're doing. Um, and, I, and I think, like everyone, the talent market is very hot. Uh, getting the right skills um, is, is quite hard work. Um, and actually retaining those skills once you've got them um, becomes even harder uh, in terms of what that looks like. I mean, I think, I think the architecture and uh, the modernization agenda, and I think those are all quite appealing uh, for talent in terms of what we're doing. So, you know, the capabilities that we're building is attracting quite a, a heavy talent market in terms of what that looks like. However, um, I, I think we've, we've actually focused quite heavily on um, the DNA of uh, digital and insurance. <laughs> So digital and technology skills, but also the technical capabilities of running an insurance business. And we needed the combination of both of those to work. So we've, we've got um, skill sets that are from other markets and other sectors, like the betting sector, the telecom sector, um, you know, loads of other um, areas outside of financial services that are actually coming in and working with us. Um, our, our propositional team is from the energy sector and from the travel industry. Um, our, our CTO is from the betting sector. Um, so, so we've got a combination of some really strong folks uh, who are complementing our quite deep technical skills in the insurance space around how you assess risk, how you underwrite risk, how you actually price for risk, what does that look like. But the combination of those two um, are actually bearing quite a bit of fruit. And so our operating model is structured uh, for us to smash those two different um, and complement those two different skill sets together to actually drive forward. But it's quite hard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's hard work, especially when you're located in Rygate yeah. um, in Surrey in, in England. So um, I think the hybrid working is helping, the remote working is actually helping for us to attract talent. But so we're, I think we're, use, we're utilizing every tool in the kit bag um, for us to ensure that we can attract the best talent, but also more importantly, retain them. Yeah, and, and, and I think that that's, the, that, uh, that's another trend I've you know, certainly seen accelerate over the last year or two is organizations pu putting a lot of effort in attracting you know, what you would call non-traditional insurance talent in, in, into the insurance market. Uh, and I think you know, the other thing like organizations, I think you know, that, that are getting on top of the, the talent agenda as much as, uh, as a part of their overall digital transformation are, are going to be the real winners um, because there is such a scarcity of talent. Uh, I mean, you know, we all talk about digital engineering and actually attracting engineering talent. I mean, it's, it's a combination of 250 technologies. I mean, and 10 being added every quarter, like where do you find these people? How do you train these people? How do you retain them? So, uh, so you know, that absolutely needs to be at the forefront of, of, the, of the agenda in terms of kind of your own digital transformation journeys. I, th I think the other thing we did, sorry, mm -hmm. you triggered the, mm -hmm. um, an another thought is, initially where we don't have all the skills, we've had to be quite creative around how yeah. we use partners. And um, you know, one of the things that we, we've done um, over the last couple of years, because we went from you know, 20 folks who were very knowledgeable about what we wanted to do with this strategy to about 600 to actually execute the strategy in two to three months. So we had quite creative partners on the pitch where they played very key roles, complementing our capability and complementing our skill set in terms of what we needed to do. And I think it's super critical. And one of the things that we're doing is those partners are helping us to upskill our internal staff as we hire new capabilities on the ground. So not only are they there to help us accelerate the execution of the architecture, but they're also there to help us essentially drive um, that, that capability uplift. So I think yeah. it's an important factor. Yeah, absolutely. I think flexibility in talent sourcing and actually where you get your talent is a, is a sort of a key part of it, especially given, given the, 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 the lack of general skills in the market. Uh, and, and last but not the least, the fourth one I want to talk about is, is sustainability. Um, now, ESG, again, you know, it's, a, it's obviously become a boardroom priority, uh, but I also feel a lot of it is lost in either very high level thinking or technical jargon around, uh, 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 around reporting. Um, I mean, my perspective is uh, a lot of the insurers are, have taken active steps around managing their uh, climate risk around the portfolio optimization, but really we haven't seen as much, uh, as much movement and innovation on the underwriting and, and, and product side. Um, but Roy, kind of, you know, back to you around the sustainability agenda, and especially given kind of the, you know, the, the, the purpose that that issue have come up with. Yeah, talk to us around kind of what you're doing around this topic. 
Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, one of our purposes is driving good uh, and, and ensuring that we've got uh, sustainability at the heart, not only of our propositions in terms of what we're doing, but also take a deep look at our partners and our investment portfolio, um, our, our claims capability. So, you know, we, we've embarked on um, a number of agenda with our supply chain around green parts. Uh, we're actively driving that quite hard. I mean, it's quite difficult for a motor insurer in the UK market um, to ensure that, uh, you know, th they're actually staying ahead of the game in terms of how they think about this proposition. But, um, but I think we're trying to do some creative things and we're actually looking at all different angles associated to how we actually drive the ESG agenda. And it's early days for us. I don't think we've got all the answers, but I think the things that we can pick out sort of across the supply chain, our investment portfolio and ensuring that they're investing in the right capabilities and, and the right um, ESG agenda, uh, vehicles, but also um, how we think about our propositions. We're driving um, a new partnership with uh, one of our PCW partners in the UK market for um, an electric vehicle campaign in terms of how we drive that forward. So we're, we're trying to look at different propositions. We're trying to look at the supply chain. We're trying to look at um, different angles associated to us getting more sustainable. So I, I, I think it's early days, but I think there's a lot more work for us to do, but it's definitely yeah, and, and I think that's probably a fair reflection on where, where a lot of the industry is. Um, uh, and the emphasis certainly, I think, now needs to be on moving much beyond um, more than just portfolio optimization and climate risk considerations on the investment portfolio to kind of product design and looking at your entire supply chain. So, you know, those are kind of the, the, the four trends around accelerated digitization, ecosystems, how you're thinking about ecosystems in the context of your business model, the concept of workforce transformation, uh, a very much a, a, a tech-enabled enterprise, but with the humans at the center and sustainability, you know, we think are going to be the defining trends of, uh, of, of the next uh, next wave of insurers, uh, uh, next wave of, um, uh, of insurance. Now, you know, there are, uh, we, I know we use insurance as a sort of like to, as, as a catch-all for all um, companies of all sizes and, and shapes, and invariably different organizations will have different agendas, but I feel like actually no matter what your size and scale is, these are absolutely the, 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 the four key things that should be on the top of, um, uh, top of everyone's agenda um, as, you, as you sort of kind of think about the future. So, so just to kind of finish off, um, hopefully that was uh, that was uh, that was useful. And thank you, Roy, for the um, for your insights. Uh, and yeah, if you want to talk to uh, either of us, you know, we'll, we'll be around. Uh, there's a QR code you can scan as well. Um, so, thank you.